Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctor. We thank you for taking time out of your busy day to watch our videos. Friends, we pray that you might give us a like, subscribe, and follow both on YouTube and Facebook. We especially desire that you might give a like to our videos. The more people like them, the more that they're uh, spread out there for people to see and made uh, available for others to see. We want the Word of God to get out to this world, especially the Gospel. That this world might hear and believe. We have the, the ability in the days which we live to reach the world like people in the past have never had. That is through this internet medium. To send the Gospel out to this world. To preach the Word of God and to teach the Word of God. Friends, we're thankful for those of you that take the time out of your busy day to watch your videos. And whether you've watched us before or whether you're new, we pray that you'll give us a chance to set before you the Word of God. We are studying here in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And today we start in chapter 11. It is one I have no doubt that many people are going to look to this to see what we have to say. This chapter brings in some teachings here that are very much misunderstood, very much are disliked, and we just pray God would help us to set before you the proper and right understanding of these verses. Now we're going to start here, verse 1, read down a ways to get to the end of uh, the main subject that is addressed in this first half of the chapter. We read here again, Paul speaking to the church of Corinth says to them here now in the 11th chapter, he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man. <clears throat> and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one, as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, Neither is the man without the woman, neither is the woman without the man, in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things of God, judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman having long hair, but if a woman having long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. <coughs> we have a multitude of things even addressed already in these 16 verses. 
and the bulk of it does deal with a very contentious issue amongst Christians. And it's an issue which many of today I feel have just forgotten altogether and cast it aside. And even those that try to hold to it, I think, misunderstand what is being set before us here. But before we ever get to that, he begins to say unto those of Corinth this. He says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Whether it be an apostle, or whether it be a pastor, or a preacher of the Word of God. We, who are the ministers of the Word of God, have a responsibility to set before you the proper way of living and thinking. That is, he said, follow be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We're not followers of the men before us, that came before us, that even yet may be in our life. But even as they ought to be followers of Christ, even as Paul was, so are we to be. The preachers, the teachers, the ministers of the Word of God, which are, yes, according to Scripture, to be men, the pastors. We're to be followers of God, of Christ even. We're to be Christ-like. We're to show forth Christ in our lives. And we're to, you're to, to follow that example. <clears throat> Not our faults and failures. Not our missteps, no. And those we ought to plan to say, no, I misstepped there. I, I was wrong doing that or thinking that. But this is how we ought to live and do. By the word of God, we explain and teach. We're to teach the all things of God that are set before us in the Holy Bible. It is the final rule of faith, all faith and authority. The final rule of all faith and authority. Jesus Christ is the only head to the churches. There is no person or group of persons. There is no council. There is no higher level between the local visible church and Christ himself. There is no other group or person in between who we are to look to to guide us. But we look to the man of God, the pastor of the church, to lead and to guide us. Even if they look to their pastor, they also look to Paul as an apostle. They look to the apostle, all of them to lead and guide them and to their pastors which were given unto them of God also as they followed Christ they were to follow that example of Christ in them and the worldliness they should speak against we speak against those things they say follow us not in those things follow us not in our faults and our failures but follow us in the Lord as we follow him follow us in that and the things we're in, we can look at and say, oh, I misstepped there. I was wrong there. Don't do that. These are as much things as he seeks to set before us. And to set before us an understanding of the order of things, for that is the next thing he deals with here. After saying, follow me as I follow Christ, he says, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. And keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Praise you, brethren, as you remember me in all things. As they remember how he lived before them, how he conducted himself before them, how he taught them the things of God. By example, not just by his words, but by his life, striving to be the example that he should be unto them. Yea, it is a, a high calling and a thing to strive for that in all things we seek mastery to be the kind of people that God would have us to be before the people, to be the examples of Christ in our life, that we put away worldliness, we put away our idols as he's dealt with in the last chapter, that we live not for our own gain, for our own profit, but for the profit of others that they might be saved, that we strive to be the example showing for Christ lifting up Christ before them, that they see Christ Jesus and not ourselves and our faults. And that they keep those things, those ordinances as he speaks of them. There's only two ordinances, church ordinances, which we are uh, commanded to keep and observe. First is the ordinance of baptism, which is the baptizing of believers, 
of those who have received the word with gladness, who have repented and believed, and by repentance, yes, it's an inward thing to start with. That we are convicted, we are pricked in our hearts of our hardness, of our sinfulness, and we see ourselves as ungodly sinners before God, before His Christ, and that we have a desire within us which is the working of the Holy Spirit, which is pricking your heart and moving you to God in faith and repentance, a repentant heart. He crushes that old stony heart and it causes you as a sinner, a lost, undone sinner, to see yourself condemned and unclean and without Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to die and go to hell. If we repent not, we will perish. Repentance starts within a man. Repentance starts within us. And it is that convicting of the Holy Spirit upon us that we are sinners, that we see ourselves and we acknowledge ourselves within our own thinking that yes, we have thought wrong, we have lived wrong, we've done wrong, and we see Christ Jesus, the perfect righteous example, who kept all things, he fulfilled all things, and we desire now to be found in him. And we cry out unto him, have mercy upon me, O Lord, save me from this wicked life. That's the beginning of repentance. And God gives us the gift of faith and salvation. And then there's an outward repentance that is after salvation. And that outward repentance is the turning from our sinful way of life. Turning from the direction we were going of self and self-gratification, self-glory. And seeking what we wanted in the world of our own lustful desires and the desires of the eyes and the flesh, turning from that and turning to God because we're already saved. We've been saved, we've been convicted, we've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus and we see the way we've been going and we no longer want to walk that way but we now that we've been turned by God and we strive to live for Him and to walk in the direction He has to do, walk that narrow path that we now see. Whereas before it was darkness and we could not discern truth from a lie, the left from the right, the right way from the wrong ways. Wrong ways, yes, plural. Many wrong ways where then there is only one right way unto salvation through Jesus Christ himself, believing and trusting in him for your salvation. Oh, that you might receive these things of God and trust in Him. And if you are saved and you repented unto God, you truly are saved and you're believing, you're believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, then is when you should seek baptism and to submit yourself unto the ordinance of baptism. And by the act of baptism, that being lowered into the water and submerged in the water is showing that you are dead to the old man and then being brought back up out of the water showing you've been born again unto the new man and that you are professing Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior and that yes you've already been saved and that you know the reason why you're going to the water because Jesus went to the water Jesus submitted himself unto baptism and he said, Repent ye and be baptized. And it's not for salvation. It's not for salvation. Doctrinally, the Word of God will prove, proves that out, that it's not for salvation. Historically, we can prove it out because they only baptize people two times a year for hundreds of years, if not more. Two times a year. And if they had sincerely believed that baptism was necessary for salvation, they'd have done it every day of the week. But two times a year is all they baptize people. And it is plainly stated and shown forth in the writings of the past that they prove people out. They desire them to profess themselves as Christians and to be desiring, they profess the desire to live godly lives because they had believed the gospel and they saw themselves as sinners and they desired, not only desired, but they were striving to now to live a godly life. And now that they would submit themselves unto baptism because the fruits of salvation were already evident and proven therein. 
No one can stand good for you. No one can answer for you. No one can come nigh unto God's throne and say, I profess faith for this one over here, so they may be baptized. That's not found in the Word of God anymore. No one can do that. That's a thinking of man that has wrongly been applied to the ordinance of baptism. Baptism is a symbolic act which we yield ourselves unto to show forth in symbolism that we have died to the old man, being buried in the water, and that we are born again as we are showing by example as we come back out of that war. Baptized unto Christ. The baptism of John, they asked, they asked the Lord, Why doest thou? Why are, who, who told you? By what authority do you these things you do? And he asked them, You tell me first this. Answer my question, I'll answer you. The baptism of John, whence was it? Was it from heaven or was it of men? Now they reasoned with themselves, if we say it was from heaven, he'll say, then why did you not believe him? But if we say it's of men, the people hold him as a prophet, and oh boy, we'll offend them, we can't do that. So they say, well, we can't tell. So he didn't answer their question either. But friends, being saved, we could tell. We know, yes, the baptism of John was from heaven. Jesus submitted himself unto that baptism. That baptism, that is a Greek word, baptizo, that's where that word baptize, baptism, it all comes from that Greek word. It literally means to immerse, to make fully wet. Pouring a little on, sprinkling a little on, does not picture death and burial. And it does not fit the standard set forth in the word of God. You must be immersed in the water. And you must be a believer first to be immersed in the water. And then who are you going to go? Jesus went to the one who had been sent from God to baptize. And then the scriptures tell us that, his, that, he, that he and his apostles baptized more, even though Christ himself baptized no one. His apostles did. His disciples and his apostles baptized people. People were now coming to him, and they were not being baptized unto John or John's baptism, but they were being baptized unto Christ, believing in that one who should save him from their sins. John himself said that there is one greater and mightier than him, the coming of whose shoelaces he was not worthy to unloose. He spoke of Christ. He even said, There is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. We're baptized unto Jesus Christ. And yes, you can show in the scriptures, in the book of Acts, to where there were those at Ephesus who knew only the baptism of John, that Paul re-baptized them. Yes, they had scriptural baptism unto John, but they would not been baptized unto Christ. Paul re-baptized them. He re-baptized them because we need to be baptized unto Christ. That's the ordinance given to the church at Jerusalem. It's the ordinance passed down to all the Lord's churches that we baptize believers and only believers. And we rebaptize, well, they call it rebaptizing. But if you've never been baptized rightly to start with, you've never been baptized. Oh, I was a baby, they baptized me. They poured a little water over my head. That's not baptism. For one, you're not old enough to profess faith. And two, you were not immersed under water. You know, historically speaking, the very first child, the first infant to be baptized was immersed under water. That's a historical fact. No, they weren't sprinkled. They weren't poured upon. They were buried under the water and brought back out because that is what it literally means, to be buried unto death and brought back up again, new life unto Christ. The baptism, again, does not save you, but it is an answer of the conscience unto God. True repentance and faith unto God, which must be a part of you already before you can be submitted unto baptism. And the other baptism we do, or the other ordinance which we do, is the Lord's Supper. He deals with that in the latter part of this chapter. It's simply put, it is the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper. And we will deal with it for them, but you must be saved be a partaker of that. You should be saved to be a partaker of that. And you should be a member of the local visible assembly where you're partaking of it at. That too, we can show forth from the Word of God. 
but keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Paul delivered those two ordinances to the churches, to all of them, to wherever he went, to every church he established. And by established, I mean he went forth into communities, preached the gospel, and those that believed he baptized. <coughs> and in baptizing them, he was establishing an assembly, a gathering of people. There were baptized believers unto Christ who then had a responsibility as believers, as Christians, as the disciples, the saints of God. They had a responsibility then not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. They had a responsibility to come together, to worship God together, worship Jesus Christ together, to worship the Godhead together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to keep the ordinances that are delivered unto the churches, to the church being the pillar and the ground of truth, the churches have a responsibility to keep the word of God, to, to preach, yea, even the whole counsel of God unto us. The Old Testament, the New Testament, to preach it all, to teach the people the things of God. We are to teach unto them, preach unto them the Old Testament things, the prophecies, and all the history therein. And how that all that pointed to Jesus Christ. We're to preach all this. We're to teach all of this. We should not be slack in it. We should strive, my friends, to cover every, all the doctrine. There's a systematic study of doctrine that we ought to strive for. We need to be continually taught the things of God, we that are believers. Tell me, can you remember back a year maybe even six months from what was taught or preached on a certain Sunday. I can almost say this, I remember we were in a certain book at certain points in history. It's going back six months or a year, I can know that we were in a certain book on the morning service and the evening service. We were in this book or that book maybe, I couldn't tell you exactly what chapter. thing is, our memories are flawed. We cannot remember everything. Some people are cursed with something that they call a photographic memory. They can remember everything they've ever seen in detail even. They can look at the encyclopedia page by page, scan the words, and then they've got an encyclopedia in their mind that's there forever, and they can just tell you right off the top of their head what every single thing is said in that book. That's a, it's a blessing and a curse unto those that have such a gift. Because, see, they also remember every single evil thing they've read or looked upon every single false doctrine they've read, every single uh, evil picture that they've looked upon, sinful and godly picture. But for us to contain and maintain the things of God, if we do not continue to read and study, it begins to gradually get away from us. We need to continually be studying and being taught the Word of God. These ordinances, the yea, the whole counsel of God that has been delivered was given unto the apostles and it gave it unto the churches and the pastors and the teachers were to continue to preach and teach the all things of God to those who are, that are saved and that have become members of those local churches to teach them the all things of God and to keep the ordinances which are delivered unto them according to the word of God. Our beliefs and all the things that we believe, we do not take single statements, single words, single phrases out of context to preach what we believe. Now you may do word studies. You may do doctrinal studies where you look at the doctrine through the scriptures. You may look at the use of the words through the scriptures. But it all has to come back down to this too. Looking in context to how it's used, how it's applied. And to those who want to take things out of context like the idea, he said, repent and be, blind, but repent and be baptized and be saved. Take that out of context like compare our scriptures to prove it out. And they teach that baptism saves. But when you study it out, you understand and realize that no, it doesn't. It only gets you wet. It does not save you. It's the answer of the conscience and the true conviction of the Holy Spirit that's within you, that where you're showing forth that you have been bought with a price, and you now, whereas you were lost and done your sins, and you were a stranger to the covenants of promise, you were a stranger to God, and you knew Him not, you've now been saved by the grace of God, and you've been given a gift. It's a gift of faith. And you've believed upon Him who has been lifted up before you, even Jesus Christ. You've believed upon Him. You're trusting in Him for your salvation. 
and you're not trusting in that work which you took part of, which is called baptism. You're not trusting in that work which you take part of, which is called the Lord's Supper. Those are physical things which you had to participate in, and thereby they are works which you do, which you yield your body unto. They're works of this life and this world, and they do not save you. Church membership doesn't save you. Being baptized doesn't save you. Taking the Lord's Supper doesn't save you. Being married doesn't save you. It's telling someone that you're a sinner. And acknowledging all your sins, listing your sins, does not save you. Confession does not save you. But these are all things that are a part of life. And yes, they could be a part of a Christian's life. And if we abide in the things that have been given unto us by the word of God and we show forth Christ in us, we are being striving to be faithful unto him, not for salvation, but because we have salvation, because we are saved. We should have a desire within ourselves to keep what we understand, what we know of the word of God. I say that because we cannot know, most of us cannot know all of this. You can read and study it all your life, and you still find and see things in here. Even when you get old, you still see things in here. Well, I didn't see that before. I didn't, I didn't understand that before. Because God is continually teaching us and showing us things. And we will always be learning, even to the end of this life. And in the life beyond this, there in heaven and glory, we're going to be learning at the feet of Jesus. We're going to be learning of the greatness of our God, of His Father, and of our Father. And then we'll, fall, we'll better understand the Trinity, the concept of it, that there is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Those three make up the Godhead. And of the spirits of God, which are many, at least seven of them spoken of in the book of Revelation, many things which in this life we don't always comprehend and fully understand, but we ought to strive to understand them. We ought to seek to keep the things which have been given unto us of God and fully understand and comprehend them. We're going to get into the heart of these things which are set before us, and the next major thing is what we call the doctrine of headship. That is the divine order of the sexes, the divine order of creation itself even, of God, of His Son. You put the Holy Spirit next, then man, then the woman, than the children. That's the divine order of headship. And we're going to get into that next week in this. And then we'll be getting into that head covering. Is there a head covering taught by the Word of God? It's not, as he says, it's not a custom. It's not an ordinance in a sense. As he said down there in verse 16 again, he says, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. See that plural, plural use of the word church there? Church is. That's because there is no single universal church, visible or invisible. But there are local visible bodies, which according to the definition of the Word of God are churches. And we all stand or fall on our own accord, our own merits. We're all judged separately by our Lord and Savior, our head, Jesus Christ. Friends, we're out of time again. And I pray God will bless those who follow along the study and those that look to these things here because I, I know this is a hot topic. May God bless and keep you, my friends, till we meet again.